In this video, we will consider again the basic subroutine used in insertion sort, inserting an element into an already sorted array. We will look at a famous algorithm called binary search to do this, and see why binary search cannot be used to speed up insertion sort, that is to give an algorithm with better worst case complexity than theta of n squared. So let's go back to the basic subroutine and insertion sort. We have a vector which is already sorted, except potentially for the last element. And we want to put this last element into the correct place so that the whole vector is sorted. When the array has size i, in the last video we gave an algorithm with running time theta of i to do this. And the question that we're going to look at in this video is, is there a better way to do this? Okay, so let's abstract out the problem here. Let's say we have an array which is already sorted, and we have some value a. And what we want to do first is we want to find an index i such that a is greater than or equal to vec of i minus 1, the i minus first entry of the vector, and a is strictly less than the ith entry of the vector. So then you see that i is the index where if we were to insert a into position i and move everything to the, to the right of i over one position, so we could insert a there, then the whole array would still be sorted. Okay, so this is the position where we should insert a in order to keep the array sorted. Now, uh, this algorithm it can be a little bit fiddly with the with the edge cases. So just to explain things um, so that things work out nicely, I'm going to pad the array by putting minus infinity in this imaginary position, let's call it minus one, and infinity in position n. Okay? So this just ensures that our definition of the index i always makes sense. Okay, so even if a is larger than everything in the array, in the original array, or smaller than everything in the original array, by adding minus infinity and infinity to the ends of the array, now we can assure, ensure that such an index i always exists. So note that this is really, we just do this for the analysis. If you're writing code for binary search, um, you're not going to actually add these boundary values into your, your vector or array. Um, it's just helpful for the presentation um, that we're going to go through right now. Okay, so let's just go through some examples to make sure that we understand the problem, that we understand what this index i looks like. Okay, so if a equals 2, then the index i we're looking for is 2. Okay, so uh, it should be the, the position of the vector where the 3 is uh, right now. Okay, because 3 is strictly greater than 2, and 2 is greater than or equal to the element before the 3, which is also 2. Okay, if a is minus 3, so a is smaller than everything in the original array, then the index i should be 0. Uh, if a is 6, then the index i should be where the 7 currently is in the original array, so that is index 4. And if a is 8, then the output should be 6. Okay, and in, in that case, right, a is strictly less than infinity, which is the element in index 6, and it's greater than or equal to uh, the element in index 5, which is 8. Okay, good. So hopefully it makes sense now what the algorithm is supposed to do, the index that we're looking for. And now we're going to look at an algorithm to find this index, which is called binary search. Okay, so in binary search, we're going to maintain two indices, which we call left and right, and that have the property that the entry of the vector at left minus 1 is less than or equal to a, and the entry of the vector at right is strictly greater than a. Okay? So, 
the idea is that we're going to maintain this invariant, right, that left and right have this property. And what we want to do is to move left and right closer and closer together until they're actually equal. And once left is equal to right, then we've found the i that we're looking for. Okay, and then we can just output it. Okay, so at the start of the algorithm, we're just going to let left be zero and right be in. Okay, and now, you know, since we've padded the array with minus infinity and infinity on the endpoints, then we're guaranteed that, that left and right satisfy the invariant uh, at, at, with this initialization. Let's look at the termination condition. So the algorithm is going to end when left is equal to right. Then we've, just by the, uh, the definition of the invariant at that time, then we've found the index i that we're looking for. And we can just output left as the answer, or, or right, doesn't matter since they're equal. OK, and now the third thing that we always look at when we have invariants is how to maintain the invariant. Okay, so we want to bring left and right closer and closer together while maintaining this invariant. And also, since we'd like to have a fast algorithm, then we want to move left and right together as quickly as possible. So the faster that they converge to the same value, the faster our algorithm terminates, right? Because the algorithm terminates when left is equal to right. So in order to reduce the distance between left and right as quickly as possible, what we're going to do is we're going to probe the middle element between them. Okay, so here's this element mid, in between, uh, halfway in between left and right. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the entry of the vector at position mid. Okay? And if a is less than the entry of the vector at mid, then we can update right to be equal to mid and maintain the invariant, right? Because a is less, strictly less, than the element of the victor, vector at mid. On the other hand, right, the other case, if, if a is not strictly less than the vector at mid, that means that a is greater than or equal to the vector at mid, then we can update left to be equal to mid plus 1. And then we'd also still maintain the invariant, right? If left is equal to mid plus 1, then left minus 1 is mid. And we know that mid, uh, vec of mid, is less than or equal to a, which is what we want for the invariant to hold. OK? So in, in either case, it's good for us, right? In either case, we're able to maintain the invariant and reduce the distance between left and right by a factor of about a half. OK, so, so here's the algorithm. We have two indices left and right. Left is initialized to be 0. Right is initialized to be the size of the vector. And we have this while loop here. As long as left is less than right, strictly less than right, we repeat the process of, so the next line after the while loop, we compute the middle element between left and right, and then we probe the middle element and see if a is less, strictly less, than the middle element. If it is, then we update right to be the middle element. Otherwise, we update left to be equal to the middle, uh, middle index plus 1. I'm sorry, I should have said we, in the first case, we update right to be the middle index, uh, and otherwise, we update left to be the middle index plus 1. OK, and when the while loop finishes, then left is equal to right, and we return left. And again, you can find this code up on Godbolt at the link there. OK, so let's analyze this algorithm. So the initial distance between left and right is n, the size of the array. Remember, we initialize left to be 0 and right to be n. And the distance between left and right, essentially, it halves in every iteration. Uh, so it has, you know, up to an additive plus or minus one, um, because there might be some, you know, floors or ceilings there. Um, 
so for example, you know, after one iteration, the distance between left and right, it's either going to be the floor of n over two or the ceiling of, of n over two. Okay, so it basically, you know, up to this uh, factor or uh, uh, term of plus or minus one, it halves in, in every iteration. And we know that the number of times we need to have n in order to get down to one is upper bounded by the ceiling of log n. So if we kind of just throw in the slack of this floors of the floors and ceilings, this you know extra plus minus one term, we can still just safely say that the running time of this algorithm is order log n. And if you think about it a little bit, you can see that on some inputs, the algorithm is going to have to take log n steps as well. So we can say that the worst case running time of binary search is theta of log n. Okay, so now we've seen how to use binary search to find the position where an element should be inserted into an already sorted array. Now, can we actually use binary search to speed up insertion sort? You know, to beat this worst case complexity uh, of theta of n squared that we gave for insertion sort. So, with binary search, you find the index where a should be inserted, but there's still another task to be done and that is actually inserting A into the array. So let's consider the case where we're using a resizable array. To insert an element you know, into the middle of this resizable array, then first we're going to have to shift all the elements to the right of the insertion point over one position. So I've shown this in the picture at the bottom of the slide here. And we have to do that, of course, to, you know, free up an empty slot where we can insert this new value. Okay, so once the slot is free, then we can actually, you know, insert the two into that empty slot. But the time to shift the elements over to the right is proportional to the number of elements that we have to shift. So again, this has worst case complexity theta of n, because in the worst case, we might have to shift all the elements over to the right. So although we could find the insertion point in time order log n, we still might have to spend time omega of n in order to actually do the insertion. And if you remember our insert1 function that we used in insertion sort, we were already spending theta of n time to do that function. Uh, and again, remember in that function, we just went from right to left doing comparisons and swaps as long as a was strictly less than its left neighbor. So in both cases, if we use binary search and then insert by shifting everything over, or the algorithm that we used in insertion sort, in both cases, the worst case running time is theta of n. So up to constant factors, we cannot use binary search to speed up insertion sort. Okay, so that was the case of a resizable array. What if we're doing insertion sort on a linked list instead? So on a linked list, we know that we can actually insert a new node into the middle of the list in constant time. As long as we're given a pointer to the element, you know, before or after where we want to do the insertion. In the case of, a, say, a doubly linked list, we can insert before or after uh, in constant time. So unlike a resizable array, the insertion step is actually fast in a linked list. However, the catch with a linked list is that we cannot quickly do binary search. And that's because in a linked list, we don't have a constant time get function, right? We cannot in constant time uh, see what the value of the ith element of the list is. The only way that we can see what what the value in the ith element of the list is, is to start walking from the front of the list or the back of the list until we get to the ith element. So both resizable arrays and linked lists have these deficiencies that don't let us insert an element uh, into an already sorted list and maintain this property of it being sorted. They don't let us do that in order log in time. So later in the course, we're going to see a data structure which 
achieves this, okay, which can maintain a sorted list with order log n time insertion. And that data structure is called a balanced binary search tree. Okay, so you can look out for that later in the course.